Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of What's on My Desk. Uh, well, uh, the hair isn't getting any nicer. Uh, Ian walked in this morning before we started taping. He usually comes in, does like a sound check. Uh, you have no idea how many videos I've recorded and then later realized that the microphone was on mute or something else and it's just a shame when you have to redo the whole thing. And we've done that a couple of times. But the first thing he said to me, Roman, do you have a brush or something? I'm like, dude, this is it. I really can't do anything about it. And then I looked at his hair and I'm like, you shouldn't really be talking. Now, here's one for you, Ian. I challenge you to pop a picture of your current haircut onto the screen and maybe do a side by side. Who do you guys looks worse? Anyway, on to some watches. There have been a few videos posted on Thursdays outside of what's on my desk, so I wanted to come back with something out of the ordinary, right? Luxury Bazaar, a place where nothing is ordinary, and I did indeed bring some extraordinary watches. I brought an Opus 5 from Harry Winston. I brought a Resins watch, as well as one from my favorite brand, and that's an Audemars Piguet, seemingly what looks like a Royal Oak Chrono, but this is their grand complications, the granddaddy of all Royal Oaks, as I would like to dub it. I'm gonna start with Resins watches, right? Made a splash in 2013 when they first came out as a liquid-filled watch. It's technically, it's not a liquid-filled watch, it's an oil-filled watch, right? This entire watch is actually filled with oil, sort of like a bubble. Notice no crown on the watch, notice there are no spaces to use a pusher. And the initial reaction that everybody has is, what the hell is this thing, right? That was when they first came out, they made a huge splash, and guess what? They're still popular till this day. Probably the biggest thing you've seen on Instagram for say, probably, is the time lapse of how this watch works. I am simply going to show you what it looks like as this watch is running. Well, how do I actually do that? Well, the stuff on the back kind of gives it away, right? Set date, set time, set day winding, right? And the way this watch works, you have sort of a neutral position off of which you then go and move this back crystal. Winding this watch is actually a back and forth motion such as this, and I'm able to do this one-handed, which is actually pretty cool, right? But let me show you how the stuff moves around on the screen as you start setting the time or the date. Every single thing comes alive on the dial of the watch. Let me go the other way. And depending on what position you are in the back, it will set again either the time, the date, uh, the day of the week, etc. And this watch has that. It has the hours, the minutes, it has the day of the week, uh, and it has the date around the dial, as you see here. Completely new concept, mad engineering from these guys. Again, not going to get into the nuts and bolts of the stuff. This is not what this channel is about. This channel is about showing these watches. There are plenty of articles from guys like Houdinki. Okay, so what's there to be said about this watch? Well, obviously, the biggest thing is the oil-filled dial or the oil-filled watch. And what that allows you is it allows you visibility for pretty much every angle. That was like the biggest thing. You can see this watch from every angle and it's very legible. So, as you can see, as I turn this watch, there's virtually, well, you're seeing the glare from the light that's in front of me, obviously. But for the most part, this watch is super legible from pretty much any angle. Hefty retail price, $42,200. And I think up until the coronavirus, you would be hard pressed to find this watch at a large discount. We're selling this watch at like 35 off. And the reason for that is because I did a barter deal where I managed to pick up four of these as part of that deal. And I got them at a better discount as usual. When they first came out and clients would request these, I didn't even have a place to get them at a discount. So I haven't really sold many of these uh, simply due to the fact that availability on these is pretty scarce. Not the easiest watch to get, but also not the easiest watch to sell it. Hefty price tag for seemingly an unknown company that just popped up in the last seven years. And I wonder how well they're gonna weather the storm I'm in a down market due to Corona right now. One of the things I love and hate about this particular watch is I love the strap, sort of that handmade feel. Stuff you often see on the aftermarket where guys make custom straps for their watches. Love that. The buckle, guys, for a $42,000 watch, you could have done a better job. I think a PVD buckle would be nice. I think even a ceramic buckle would be nice. This is cheap, flimsy, and if I was wearing this watch, I would probably replace this buckle. I know you guys are going to want to talk about resale value. Again, this is going to suffer the fate of a lot of the independents. This is going to suffer the fate of a lot of those unknown brands that are unproven in the market, right? Uh, and again, from a dealer's perspective, somebody bringing me one of these, I'm going to base my purchase price on my history of sales, history of demand, requests, etc. 
In the watch industry, in the world of horology, it's extremely, extremely difficult to think outside the box. In fact, the only thing you get outside the box is stuff you see from independents. 95% of the industry follows suits and continues making the same thing over and over and over. Do we blame them for doing that? No, a watch is a watch. A power reserve, a chronograph, a perpetual calendar, a turbion, a minute repeater, a combination of thereof. All those wonderful functionality or complications as we like to call them in a watch have been done the same for hundreds of years, right? So it is extremely difficult to be innovative. So to come up with something different, to come up with a fresh breath of air from the everyday norm of the watch to me is super exciting, which is why I love this particular watch, which is why I love a lot of the independent watches because even though it's the same functionality as the way it's presented, you know, with the dial turning and virtually no hands on this watch, right? This is what sings to me. And this is when the phrase, buy what you like first and foremost, really comes in because you know what? Somebody's gonna look at this watch and say, wow, 42,000, for who, for what? I don't know this brand. I don't know what it's gonna be worth when I decide to part with it. This is where you really truly have to fall in love with a watch in order to purchase something like this. Anyway, enough about these guys. Let, let's move on to something also different, innovative, and again, a brush of fresh air. A watch that's not new, a watch that's been around for years at this point, and that is the Harry Winston Opus 5, right? At a first glance, you're gonna look at this thing and you're gonna be like, Wait a minute, that's an Herbert. Well, you're right, but you're also wrong. Okay, so I've spoken about Harry Winston Opus 5s in the past where Harry Winston would, collab would collaborate with outstanding watchmakers, a lot of independents, to come out with something that's out of this world, that's different, that doesn't look like anything the modern world of horology produces, right? Uh, so this was the work of a gentleman by the name of Max Buser, who collaborated with Felix Baumgartner of Herbert to create the Harry Winston Opus 5. Let's quickly go through the watch. So you guys are familiar with Erwerks and how they work. And in a nutshell, this is what this watch does. Let me just open this crown. So not a super complicated watch. It's complicated in the way that the time is displayed and that is what your typical Erwerk will do where you're going to notice the cubes. Right now it's showing 2.30, 2.30, right? Where you're gonna see the cubes seemingly magically turn to the correct time as they go in order. And as they go around, as I move them around, you'll notice the cubes will change time on their own sort of to get ready for that next hour. So, so the second cube will be lined up at the next hour. And as I go over, the third cube starts to slowly turn to line up the following hour just the same. It has a day-night indicator and a five-day power reserve indicator on the watch. What's most special about this watch is they made it retrograde, which is extremely difficult in the construction such as this. And they did it in a great way. If you notice how the spring works when this thing drops back down. It's just sort of like a dead drop. I love that. You won't see this in most of the retrograde watches where it just kind of free falls down to the bottom and I love that. What else is in the back of this watch? Well, your typical adjustment which you see in Erwerks, which allows you to adjust the watch to run faster, a bit slower. And this is a watch that uh, shows mileage. That's right, it's kind of like a car. And what do I mean by showing mileage? You can actually see the mileage on this car because what these guys did is they put a service indicator in here. Now, this is zero to five years, which is one of watch needs service. And as you can see, currently this watch has not really been used much, right? So you have, it's been used less than a half a year. So that's one, two, three, four, five years. So this is right below the half a year mark. This can mean one of two things. Either the watch has rarely been worn since it came out, or it has already been serviced. And if it has been serviced, Harry Winston will reset this particular gauge for you. I would not give this to my local watchmaker to service uh, because the reset mechanism is pretty complex and I think they did that purposely so that the watch would be sent for service to them. Why else is this watch so iconic? Well, first of all, this was the last watch that Max Buser did at Harry Winston before starting MBNF, right? So this sort of gave a roadway to MBNF as well as it gave roadway to Felix Baumgartner at Ulrich. This is what sort of introduced that to the world and made it a little more mainstream. And the Opuses exist till this day, right? Uh, I think the most notable uh, Opus would be the Opus 3 that was designed by Vianney Holter, that was the one that sort of looked like a slot machine, right? Uh, and this is probably uh, just as famous. Out of the entire Opus series, the Opus 5 is the one that's probably the most famous and probably is the most popular till this day. Limited edition of 50 pieces, they also made it in platinum. And I remember prior to 08, Platinum Opus 5 was trading as high as $165,000 with the Rose counterpart trading upwards of $150,000. And the original retail price was less. I don't remember what it was off the top of my head. 
very big watch, a very heavy watch. Even on Rose, it's very heavy. Platinum is extremely heavy. So, you know, if you if you don't like heavy watches, this is definitely not a watch for you. But surprisingly, it sits well on a wrist, even a relatively average size wrist such as mine. Very comfortable too for a humongous watch. Look how tall this watch is. It's huge. Where is this watch trading at today? It's still hovering around that $100,000 mark and you'd be hard pressed to find one of these for guys that collect independent watches for guys that love independent watches this is one of the holy grails to have this kicked off max Buser. this kicked off felix baumgartner at Urwerk, right so uh you know you won't find many of these out on the market but but post uh opus 5 it just so happened that we hit the oa crisis a few years later and post max Buser leaving I don't know if it's coincidental or not. Every other Opus has haven't really done that well in terms of resale value. I remember I had the Opus 7 and I owned it cheap and I couldn't give it away. Opus 9, same thing. You see them trading under $100,000, right? It's when Max left and he went on his own. He, I guess he has sort of a cult following. They followed him elsewhere and people sort of stopped paying attention. But the older Opuses, specifically the Opus 3, I know of one for sale right now. People are asking a quarter million dollars. Seems like it's high, but good luck finding one of those, right? And beyond his stuff, Trace to the Roof, especially some of his older stuff as well. And Opus 5 is sort of in that same boat. I mean, I love the Opus 12, for example, right? Emmanuel Boucher movement. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a ridiculous watch. Some of the innovation that goes into every single Opus is absolutely crazy. In fact, some of the later Opus are a lot more complicated than this particular watch, but for some reason, it's the Opus 5 that usually takes the cake. And this is, if people are looking to buy an Opus, this is usually the first watch that they look at, either in platinum or in rose gold. So much for different, out of the ordinary, but you know, what else is out of the ordinary? A super complicated watch. And this is the granddaddy of complicated Audemars Piguet. This is a Royal Oak Chrono split second chrono perpetual minute repeater i talked to you guys about the history of Audemars rbk in the past this is what these guys started with Audemars rbk is one of those brands that didn't start off by making a time only watch they started off by making complex movement for pocket watches for tiffany and company and they continued that tradition and while i bring you the grand comp from ap this is a 45 millimeter royal oak it's a very thick watch obviously due to the fact that there's a lot of complications in it it's a heavy watch this is a completely white gold watch this sucker does weigh quite a bit it has a very traditional a royal oak look nothing different nothing differentiates this watch from a royal oak perpetual if you look at it from far of course it's the thickness in that little trigger on the left that tells you this is a seven hundred and twenty thousand dollar watch retail so let's start with the split second chrono right i mean you guys seen split second chronographs works but it's just sort of satisfying to play with it your middle button will split your seconds and obviously there's your stop there's your one reset the seconds to go back and there's your main reset to go back Obviously, perpetual calendar, automatic movement, beautifully decorated. And what I love is the fact that this is exhibition back. You can see the inner workings of this monster. And, you know, and for those that love nuts and bolts, and I often don't talk about nuts and bolts, but I obviously love the nuts and bolts on every watch. When you're able to put on display one of the most complicated watches out there, and it's beautifully decorated at the same time, to me, that's pretty unbelievable. Let's hear the minute repeater, right? As I always say, music to my ears, right? Let's talk monies. I know you guys are always wondering. 720,000, historic. I've showed you the grand comp on a bracelet, the rose gold that retail for a million sixteen. I told you the resale on it is about a third of the price, right? We've sold that watch since. This is going to suffer the same fate, right? A few reasons. Number one, very big watch, right? This is not for a small wristed individual. This is somebody that can A, wear a heavy watch. Harry Winston is very heavy. This is extremely heavy, right? Price tag, 720000 I will give you a figure from auction of this particular watch. The last time this watch went through a major auction was Sotheby's on June 2019 in New York. And this watch sold for 250000 USD, which makes it... By the way, when you guys look up these auction results, always add the buyer's premium because they sh they all, they do this purposely. They don't show you what it's sold for with the buyer's premium. They try not to punctuate on that, and there's a reason for that because they charge 24%, right? So 
So 250,000 times 1.24. For reality, this watch sold for 310,000. That's the last auction result. I have sold these watches anywhere from 250 to 350,000 dollars, depending on condition, how complete they were, and based on how I managed to buy this watch. This guy, we're gonna be selling somewhere around that quarter of a million dollar mark, uh, maybe a little bit more. I uh, haven't really decided yet. I haven't put this online because I have a few private clients that actually are looking at this particular watch because it's a smoking deal. If you take this, right? Let's take this and let's take, uh, oh, I don't know, RM1103 Rose Gold, right? Current market on that watch is $250,000, which that is a chronograph and this is a grand complication and ask yourself, which would you rather have? A complicated watch that says this, or what are the most, or probably the most hype chronograph in the market today, and that's the RM1103 Rose, right? Well most popular chronograph is still the Daytona. But if you wanna talk about hype versus value in around the same price range, that's probably a comparable watch. I don't think I have to answer that question. I'm sure you guys know which one I would prefer. And this just goes to show how funny the world of horology is today. A super complex watch from a major brand, top three most hottest uh, brands in the market today outside of Rolex, right? I'm referring to Richard Mille Patek and Audemars. You can pick up at what to me is a steal. Now I know you guys are gonna say, oh yeah, a quarter million bucks, huh Roman? Quarter million dollars, certainly a steal, Roman. Of course it's not, everything is relative and I've talked about this before. Uh, there are guys out there for whom a $250,000 watch is an affordable timepiece, and there's guys out there for whom a $5,000 or $3,000 watch is affordable. Uh, I always say the same thing, buy what you like first and foremost within the means you can afford. And just open up your eyes, there's certainly a lot of out of the ordinary things out there to look at outside of Nautilus, a Royal Oak, a Pepsi, or a Batman. One of the reasons I love doing what I do, and that is being a watch dealer, right, is because how infinite the world of horology is in terms of options, right? Whether it's complications, whether it's rarity, whether it's something different, whether it's a watch for $500 or a watch for a million dollars, it's just so infinite. It's infinite going backwards, like these pieces, or if you go back even further, you get into vintage and antique stuff. And it's also infinite going forward. You got guys out there that keep traditions alive, by continually making complex pieces such as this. They take a twist on a traditional function, but do it in such a way where it's so different in the likes of, let's say, this guy. So guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. As always, I try to bring things that are different out of the ordinary, as we like to say here, and whether or not you can afford to buy these timepieces, I hope you enjoy me showing these things. And as usual, you know what to do. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you're not subscribed to my channel already. And most importantly, hit the share button because that's what allows my channel to grow organically. Other than that, guys, I'll see you next week for more watch reviews and other videos. Bye.